Hello, and welcome to episode 36 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, December 13th, 2020. And I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, and I'm here with my dad, Dan, through Zoom. Hey, dad. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good to see you. And I don't have a mask on, but, but I'm by myself. Yeah, it's okay my, because my, we're. There's on nobody Zoom. around. So I, I don't have a mask either. We're socially distanced. So, so um, this week, my dad is continuing to talk about the Spanish. I know last week, dad, you're talking about cosmology and astrophysics oh, yeah. well, and well, that's, all that's, this that's, stuff. I you know, sort of blew my mind. Talking about, talking about clash of cultures. That's what I was talking about. Okay. So well, and then you left off talking about pigs. So, Weird. all right. So I'll let you take it away. Well, you know, this is going to be a pretty serious subject. Um, and it goes back to a basic truth that I've said so many times, and I know I probably sound repetitive. But, you know, most people do not know what history is. They think it's the past. And it's not, it's our thinking about the past and reflecting on the past. And one of the great realities is that the past has a direct impact on how we live today. And there are things I would contend that are going on today that are very much produced by the attitudes that the Spanish and other Europeans brought to the new world when they came here in the 1400s, 1500s, and 1600s. And part of what I'm going to do today is to re revisit in more detail the activities of, of this man right here. And that's Hernando de Soto because he was really the first white man to enter what is now the Southeastern United States. He wasn't the first to come ashore. That was Ponce de Leon in 1513, but Ponce de Leon didn't, didn't stay. And there were two efforts to try to establish Spanish colonies in the Florida Peninsula, what we now know as the Florida Peninsula, in the early 1500s, and they both failed. But the first one really to come ashore with, as I said last week, almost 600 men in 1539 was this fellow right here, Fernando de Soto. And I, I, I'm not going to try to whitewash this, you know. Um, it, it's brutal. It's brutal. It's arrogant. And it's, uh, it, it's just horrific. We actually have two good firsthand accounts, not written by DeSoto, but by, written by two of his men that went on this uh, multi-year journey that DeSoto financed with his own money, which he had plenty of. And it was literally eventually to kill him. He, uh, of course, killed many uh, Native Americans unintentionally, although he killed a lot more intentionally. Unintentionally because of the disease and the diseases that the um, Europeans brought to the Native Americans against which they had no immunity. We're talking about measles, influenza. We're talking about uh, smallpox. We're talking about diphtheria. We're talking about the common cold. We're talking about a lot of stuff. And a lot of those, as I told you last time, were actually carried by pigs because uh, pigs were not native to 
the New World, and DeSoto brought them purely to, to provide some of the food for his men because he had a huge expedition for that day and time, about 600 men, which was a huge, huge challenge just to feed once they went ashore. And of course, he only had 13 pigs, but pigs breed very, very rapidly. And you can get more and more and more pigs. And as I suggested to you before, pigs were also not native to this region. And of course, every pig that you have in the United States today, the first ones went back to Fernando de Soto. And I also talked last week about clash of cultures. And let me tell you one thing that really made it impossible for Native American culture and European culture to coexist. One of them had to dominate the other. And it mainly had to do with attitudes about land. Native Americans had no concept of private property. They thought dividing up the um, dirt was as meaningless as dividing up the air or dividing up water. Families did have land that they farmed as families, but it didn't belong to them. They just used it. And when the family got smaller or bigger, the tribal chief would redistribute the land accordingly as to how many mouths were to be fed. Well, you know, you can drive down through Mecklenburg County today and you can see some land that's fallow it's not being used. And there might be somebody in North Dakota that owns it who inherited it from his brother-in-law. You know, it, 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 we, we are, I mean, one of the fundamental attitudes about the land you know, on the part of European culture was that land was to be carved up and owned by the person and a deed was to be filed. And this made it really impossible for these two cultures to survive. Now, Hernando de Soto, when he traveled, and as, and as we told you, as I told you last time, it was a, a, a big journey when he started in 1539. And he was, he, was, he was a very effective commander of men. Imagine to make these men march uh, all of these distances over land, eating pork, waiting for those pigs to multiply, uh, taking food from Native, Native American villages when they came. And you can see the circuitous route that they went. And they, they came primarily because they wanted to find gold. They thought that, I mean, by the way, interested to know, you'd be interested to know that when De Soto came from Spain to the New World, he was only 14 years old. And he came specifically to to, um, to, to, to get rich. And he participated in the conquest of Nicaragua. And he also was very directly involved, as I told you last week, in the conquest of Peru. In fact, he was the one who found the route to Cusco, which is the famous capital of the Incas. And that's where they got all that gold. So they had great expectations that there was going to be all kinds of gold up here in the United States or what's now the United States in North America when they made this particular trip. So I told you last time he came from Cuba because when he had come back to the New World in, in 1537, the King of Spain made him the governor of Cuba 
and gave him the authority to go on this expedition. And of course, you can see over here at the at the end of the the the, the whole journey, as far as De Soto was concerned, is where he died of fever. The remaining about 300 of his men came on down the Mississippi River, went into the Gulf of Mexico, and went back to Cuba. Now, I told you there was no way for these two cultures to coexist. There was no way. Now, there was no doubt about which one would prevail if there was conflict. And that was because the Spanish had greater military power. The first thing they would do when, when, when he would go on this route and would come upon the territory that was occupied by a specific tribe, and by, by the way, most of them belonged to that Mississippian culture with the mound builders that we saw at the Town Creek Indian Mounds a couple of weeks back. He would always ask them one thing, or two things, really. He would, he would want to know where the chief was, where the big dog was. Now, a lot of people say, well, how did they communicate? Well, most of it was by, by gestures. You know, they'd say, you know, they'd say, you know, big chief or whatever, where, you know, where, uh, anyway, so they want to know where the chief was because they knew if they captured the chief, it would absolutely devastate the local tribe. And the other thing that they'd, they'd point to rings on their fingers, they had gold rings mm. and they want to know where the riches were. Now, when they moved into these villages, they really had uh, three primary weapons that they used to be able to overwhelm them. And two of them are represented here um, back really all three of them are. You can see hanging on the side of this, this is a long sword right here. Now there's been a great deal of archeological digging done along, along the route that DeSoto took between 1539 and 1543. And they find all these skeletons that see these horrible sword wounds, like whole shoulders cut off. Mm -hmm. Where these, these Spaniards on top of these horses would immediately have leverage to come down on these uh, Native Americans with these horrific swords. The second thing they used, of course, were, were, was the horse. Now, I, I mentioned to you before that no horses were native to North America. These Native Americans had never seen a horse before. And a horse, in a sense, was almost like a tank. You know, there was no way for the, the Indians really to effectively resist a frontal cavalry attack, which these Spaniards would make dressed as they were with this heavy armor. And the third thing was they had war dogs. And the war dogs were trained to kill people. Now, you know, I don't know about you, Mary Dana, and I guess it's uh, one of my failings. I, and I know this is going to make many of you very, very very uh, upset. I don't like dogs. Oh, I knew that was coming. I do not like dogs. You know, dogs are very, very dangerous animals, particularly when they pack up. And when they're trained to kill, uh, they, are, they are extremely, extremely. I was actually attacked by a Doberman Pinscher when I was was a little boy and I, I really never have gotten over it. Yeah, I see that's probably. Sometimes I have dreams about it and um, I, I just don't, I'll go into somebody's house and they got a dog. I have to really 
restrain myself from saying what I really feel. But what about anyway, like a chihuahua? I don't like any dogs. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not saying people that do like dogs, that's fine. If you want to have Fido and feed him and pretend he likes you, that's fine. God bless America. You know, they're, they're pack animals. But they had dogs, and these dogs were just absolute. And I, I did a little drawing here that shows these dogs attacking. Here it is. Oh, I noticed that earlier. I thought it looked like a. Well, lion you can see the dogs are. You know, look, look at this. Look at this dog, right? See this dog over here? Look at this dog. It's biting that something. guy's face off. Your face, yeah. I mean, can you imagine? And of course, uh, the Spaniards would, because here's the thing: they would demand two things. When De Soto came upon a village, he would tell them two things, Mary Diana. He'd say, first of all, that this territory no longer belonged to them; it belonged to the King of Spain. And they would make a point of taking the Spanish flag and sticking it in the ground. And the other one was that they told them they had to convert to the Roman Catholic faith. And they were very specific. They said if they didn't do these two things, they'd let the dogs loose. They'd come at them with their horses. They'd kill them. They'd burn down their houses and whatever else. And the, the whole attitude was that no resistance to what the Spanish wanted to do was to be tolerated under any circumstances. And you know, and here again, it's probably going to upset some people. But you know, you hear so much about this 1619 movement, which is the year that the first Africans were brought to Jamestown. Those weren't the first slaves that white people enslaved by a long shot. De Soto, uh, he, he enslaved a whole bunch of Native Americans on his trip. He'd make them to be they had to carry the stuff. He made uh, carriers out of them. He enslaved them. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. You know, I hear I hear a lot about um, white supremacy. Well, I tell you, dear folks. I mean, I, I you you just have to say it for what it was. I mean. This was white supremacy on steroids. There was absolutely no regard for the legitimacy of Native American culture, Native American beliefs, Native American attitudes. It was, you either submit or we're going to kill you. And, you know, that's, and I'm not singling out the Spanish. You know, when you talk about the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British and the French, who were the, the other, quote, Europeans who came to the New World, their, their attitude was, was very similar. And, I mean, that's, you know, you think about, well, what, what, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, I mean, you know, it's just what what would you have have we all benefited from the fact that these people did this? Well, <laughs> well, you want to you want to you want to give North Carolina back to the, you know, to the to the to the Tuscarora? I mean, that's just, it's, it's just a reality. 
And of course, I mentioned before that what DeSoto did did not end Spanish America. The Spanish really were pretty much uh, top dogs in the southeastern United States until the mid 1600s. Uh, they were the most powerful. They did establish, as I told you last time, St. Augustine, 1565, the oldest masonry fort in the United States is in St. Augustine. It was not built until 1672, but the Spanish, of course, were still very much in control of Florida and much of the Southeast at that time. So, you know, this is- and, Is and that, that a picture and, of it there, I'm guessing? That is it. Right, yeah. okay. Absolutely, I've been there. It's an impressive fort. I mean, St. Augustine is, uh, is uh, you know, as I told you before, Jamestown, 1607. Uh, the Plymouth, and by the way, you know what the, you know what the pilgrims did, these good Christians that were seeking freedom did to the Native Americans. They did proactive attacks against Native Americans. And by the way, decapitation, cutting somebody's head off, was a very common practice in the warfare that the Spanish engaged in. And I don't want to make it out like the Native Americans were not like sweet little honey children. There is nothing more fundamental than territory, wanting to control your territory. I might have mentioned last last week that your mother and I were sitting out in our front yard about two months ago, and my goodness, as big as squawking crow, crows started going nuts. Oh yeah. And the reason was that a bunch of outside crows were coming in and, and and trying to inhabit the territory up near Zio's restaurant in those big trees where these other crows were living. I mean, it is fundamental to want to protect your territory. The Native Americans fought. They were ambush fighters. They had bows and arrows and they had clubs and they decapitated people. But it was a brutal, brutal, brutal process. There is no way to sugarcoat it. And it remained that way until Native American culture was basically obliterated. Now, from St. Augustine in 1566, the Spanish moved into what is Georgia and South Carolina. And they went to St. Elena, which is present day Paris Island. And here's some excavations of some Spanish forts that exist within the Paris Island Marine Base to this day. And St. Elena, as they named it, was the capital of what they were now calling New Spain. And they saw as what they were going to want to do to really build a very firm, expansive colonial empire and they basically claimed everything that is in North America, north of Mexico for Spain. Now, the other person that I wanted to, 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 to mention is this uh, San Juan uh, Pardo, P-A-R-D-O. Now, I mentioned him because he was, now we, I think, as I told you last time, I believe DeSoto came up the Catawba River too. Mm -hmm. I remember I you think said he that. came up there right close to Belmont. I don't know which side of the river he came on, but I'm sure he came up the river. Well, I'm not sure, but that's the best, the best evidence. We know Pardo did. 
Now, Pardo is about 30 years after, not quite 30, about 30 years after De Soto. We're talking about 1566, 1567, and 1568. San Juan Pardo left from what is now Paris Island. And his job was to try to build a road and a series of forts that would protect that road that would eventually lead to the mountains and beyond the mountains and they hoped would go all the way to Mexico so that there would be an overland route that would connect New Spain with Mexico. And he built a number of forts. He built, I don't know, six or seven forts. The most important one, which he named for himself, the Fort of San Juan, San Juan Pardo, was in the approximate location currently of Morganton, North Carolina. It was in the Piedmont, but it was within sight of the mountains to the northwest. And here is the state historic highway marker, which says Fort San Juan built by Juan Pardo in 1567 at native town of Jara, served as Spanish outpost and it was raised by Indians 1568. And there's been extensive archeological investigations here. And it's still ongoing as well. There's extensive, extensive uh, archeological investigation. Now, this is the oldest white settlement that we have clear archeological evidence of in all of North Carolina. You remember, uh, I, I can't remember the exact date of the Lost College, it's in the 1580s. So this is, this is about <laughs> 20 years before the Roanoke settlement, which of course didn't make it. I mean, right. That, you know, you, we all know that story. But that indicates the degree to which there was Spanish occupation. Now I will say this, that San Juan Pardo's attitude toward the Native Americans is about the same as that by De Soto. Total intolerance. The only thing that was permissible was obedience. But he didn't have quite as many men. He only had about 160. He did build a fort there, an outpost. He went back to the coast to get more supplies. He left, I don't know how many men he had there, maybe 40, something like that. Well, the Native Americans came and killed them all but one. Oh. So you know what their attitude was toward that, toward that outpost. So, I mean, that's, that's, but that's part of our history. Now, clearly, when you let's look at this map here now we're we're actually coming now in into a later period but i want to talk about what happened to the spanish territory in the united states as the english began to settle along the Eastern seaboard beginning in 1607. And as the Dutch began to settle along the Hudson River Valley, all in the 1600s, they of course were, their attitude toward the Native Americans was not one bit different than the attitude of the Spanish. We were gonna push them aside they were not going to stand in our way and we were going to take their territory. Now, by the time that the United States of America was created, 
And by the time that we won the Revolutionary War, and by the year 1800, the United States had expanded essentially to the Mississippi River, except for Florida, which remained in the hands of the Spanish. But the vast majority of the land to the west was Mexico. What we now know as Mexico was is much smaller than what was Mexico in 1800. Now I want to talk. I'm I'm going to deal a little bit. Of, how am I doing on time? By the way, thirty minutes. Okay. Let me make a statement that I think most historians would agree with. The least known consequential president in the United States was James Knox Polk. <laughs> now, let me repeat that again. The least known, most important president of the United States was James Knox Polk. I bet if you ask somebody to name presidents of the United States, I would bet you 10 to 1 that almost nobody would name James Knox Polk. Let me ask you a question. Oh, no. Okay. What? Where does your older sister live? She lives in Seattle, Washington. Well, outside of Seattle, Washington. You've already answered the question, but I will... Um, ask it anyway. In what state does she live? Oh, Washington State. Well, there's also, uh, uh, let me tell you, let, let, let me tell you that John Knox Polk became president in 1844. When he became president, John Knox Polk was born in Mecklenburg County. Yeah, I was going to say. He was born in Mecklenburg County. In fact, there's a state historic site on old US 521, just below Pineville, that I would bet you the vast majority of people who live in Mecklenburg County don't know about and hadn't been there. It's not the actual cabin in which he was born. It's not the actual specific place where he was born. But it does celebrate his birth. He was actually born a few miles to the west of this site. He was really born in Steel Creek, more than in the area below Pine. But there is no question that he was born in Mecklenburg County, part of that Scotch-Irish group that came. Well, why didn't they put the site where he was actually born? Uh, well, I don't know the exact, but I don't think the property was available. I oh, just okay. don't think the owner was willing to sell. Well, let me name the states. John Knox Polk brought the following states into the United States. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm re Washington must be one of them. Washington, Oregon, California, or at least all except the so-called Baja California that they left with Mexico, that little finger that, you know, here, sticks mm -hmm. down. Okay, Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Nevada, Utah, and part of Colorado. John Knox Pope. He brought more territory into the United States than any other president 
has ever brought into it. And he came, when he became president in 1844, he bought totally into the concept of manifest destiny. Now, uh, how am I doing on time? You've been talking like 35 minutes. Well, I, I, I got to I gotta, I gotta do it anyway. I want to play this little thing here. <laughs> okay. Are you going to uh, continue I'm next gonna, week? It's not, sounding it, like it. <laughs> except for one thing. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get there. That's how I saw it and see it still. And how stands the city on this winter night? more prosperous, more secure, and happier than it was eight years ago. But more than that, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow is held steady, no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness towards home. And that was Ronald Reagan. I'm very, very aware of I that. know, but I, well, I want to make sure everybody knew who, who were uh, just listening. In fact, that was kind of like his farewell speech. Mm -hmm. Now, he was talking about what is known as American exceptionalism. And he even invoked God. And this was very fundamental. There were two components to Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny said that the United States was ordained by God to be a land of liberty and freedom, and it must spread from one ocean to the other. It must go from the Atlantic to the Pacific. One America. Now, there's a problem. There are a bunch of uh, Mexicans out there. Mexico owns California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and they still claim Texas. The British claimed what we now call the Oregon Territory. And that is what eventually was agreed to between the United States and Great Britain that the 49th parallel would form the border between the two countries. And therefore, we got Washington and Oregon. But God mandates that there will be one America from sea to shining sea. And James K. Pope bought into that 100%. He knew that if he annexed Texas, that it would mean war with Mexico. Now, Texas had gained its, quote, independence in 1836, when Sam Houston defeated the Mexican army. But the Mexicans didn't recognize it. So technically, Mexico still considered Texas to be their territory. James K. Polk offered to buy all that Mexican territory that I just enumerated, except for Washington and Oregon, 
which the United States reached a settlement with Britain over. And those Spanish, those obstinate people refused to sell. Now, as I told you before, there were basically two elements to manifest destiny. One was racial. That is white Protestants need to get rid of all them Roman Catholics out there and all those places that have these Spanish missions that are worshiping the Pope. And the other one, of course, was political, that we had an obligation to provide freedom and the superiority of our culture. So literally, James K. Polk prayed that there'd be a war. He wanted Mexico to vote a war with us so badly when they refused to pay. He and his wife would pray in the morning for a God would give them a war. <laughs> well, he annexed Texas in 1845. He sent troops down to the Rio Grande. He hoped that would provoke a military response. There was one. He said, oh, look, American blood's being shed. He declared war on Mexico. We sent an army down there from 1845 to 1848, and we captured Mexico City. One of the great generals, by the way, in that war was Robert Edward Lee. We don't have many statues to Robert Edward Lee survived in these days. So James K. Polk really eliminated Spanish control of the Southwest. The last element came a few years earlier by an agreement between the United States and Spain. I believe it was 1821 when Spain agreed to give us the Florida Peninsula. So the Spanish are gone. So James Knox Polk, Every time you suckers go out and watch the Dodgers play in Los Angeles or the Seahawks play in Seattle, think of John Knox. <laughs> now, the only group I'm going to, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this next week. I'm going to talk about the African-Americans because okay. that, and, and there we get more into some really interesting things, including Reverend Raphael Warnock. Do you know who Reverend Raphael Warnock is? No. But he I is, guess I'll find out next week. He's one of the candidates for the Senate seat in Georgia that's going to occur on the. Oh, Senate. yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> was it interesting? Yeah. Okay. It was interesting. Thank you, Dad. Well, I'm glad to help you. It's a, <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a anyway. I, I, no, I've I, learned all these things I I didn't know. So. Well, the thing is that we're going to find. I didn't even mention the Gadsden Purchase, which we we did pay the Mexicans ten million dollars in eighteen fifty three to get southern New Mexico and southern Arizona, a little slip about the size of Pennsylvania, put a railroad through, and that completed the lower 48 states. Oh, all right. Okay, well, Dad, thank you. And we'll continue next week. And thanks everybody for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, Adios. Dad. Adios, adios. <laughs> oh,